Siren Kierkegaard, Various Readings. Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7. Siren Kierkegaard, by David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota. Editor A. M. Strudevant, February 1920. Chapters 1 through 3, pages 1 through 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Father and Son 1. The outer aspects of Kierkegaard's career suggest the placid and uneventful life of a student and man of letters. Born in Copenhagen on the 5th of May, 1813, the youngest son of a merchant of means, he received the humanistic discipline of a classical school and was enrolled in the university at the age of 18. The ten years following were spent in somewhat discursive studies, ranging over the fields of ascetics, philosophy, and theology. At 27, he received the degree of Magister Artrium and soon thereafter entered into an engagement of marriage, broken after a year upon his own initiative. He remained unmarried, and from this time until his death, which took place on the 11th of November, 1855, he devoted himself unremittingly to his literary labors, unfolding an extraordinary productivity. Kierkegaard was endowed with a sensitive organism, and under the calm surface of his outward life there stirred a tense spiritual vitality. The trait which Wordsworth eulogizes as a mark of spiritual elevation, the capacity to be excited to significant feeling without the application of gross or violent stimulants, was his in an extraordinary degree. Events which in the lives of most men would have passed without creating a ripple upon the surface stirred his soul to its depths, and hence the apparent exaggeration which so many of his critics have found in his interpretation of himself and his experiences. The man of genius is naturally characterized by freshness and fullness of feeling, and Kierkegaard's personal experiences were certainly deeply felt so profoundly, indeed, that they serve to stimulate in him a reflection of universal significance. 2. Both parents were of peasant stock. The father, Michael Pedersen Kierkegaard, came to Copenhagen as a boy of twelve and was apprenticed to an uncle engaged in trade. He eventually set up for himself achieved success, and retired at forty, with a competence regarded as considerable for the times. This retirement from business synchronized with his second marriage, a year after the death of his first wife. Of the seven children of his second marriage, Surin Aubi was the youngest. Thus, the father was already fifty-seven years old at the time of Surin's birth, while his mother was forty-five. Surin's mother had been her husband's housekeeper. Of a cheerful and domestic disposition, she seems to have been but little capable of entering into the intellectual life of her two gifted sons, and appears to have exerted a minimum of influence upon Kierkegaard's development. His journals maintained silence with regard to her. The father was a dominant figure, austere and precise, a deep strain of melancholy in his disposition, nurtured by unhappy and disquieting memories, tended in its turn to keep these memories alive. From this melancholy he sought relief in a pietistic religiosity, and to some extent, it appears, in philosophical reading. To him, Kierkegaard attributes the deepest formative influences of his life. A merchant who retires at forty from a successful business career in order to have leisure to repent his sins, read Wolfian metaphysics, and bring up his children in the fear of God cannot be set down as an ordinary or commonplace character, and it is not surprising that his influence upon the son should have been profound. The melancholy which was the common heritage of father and son can be described by citing a single characteristic trait. One day while herding sheep on the bare Jutland heath, Embittered by his privations and oppressed by loneliness, the elder Kierkegaard, who was then a boy of eleven or twelve, had mounted a hill and assailed with curses the God who had condemned him to so wretched an existence. 
In Kierkegaard's journal for the year 1846, there is a reference to this incident in the following terms. The terrible fate of the man who had once in childhood mounted a hill and cursed God because he was hungry and cold and had to endure privations while herding his sheep, and who was unable to forget it even at the age of eighty-two. When, after Kierkegaard's death, this passage was shown to his surviving elder brother, Bishop Peter Christian Kierkegaard, he burst into tears and said, That is just the story of our father, and of his sons as well. Elsewhere, in stages on the way of life, Kierkegaard suggests that these dark moods serve to link the father and the son in a fellowship of secret and unexpressed sympathy. There once lived a father and a son. The son is a mirror in which the father sees himself reflected, and the father is a mirror in which the son sees himself as he will be in the future. But these two did not often look at one another in this manner for their daily intercourse was carried on through the medium of a gay and lively conversation. But sometimes it happened that the father would pause and turn with sad face toward the son, saying as he gazed into his eyes, Poor boy, you are the victim of a silent despair. This was all that ever passed between them. No explanation of the meaning of these words was ever vouchsafed, nor any discussion of how far they might possibly be true. The father thought that he was responsible for the boy's melancholy, and the son thought that it was he who caused his father so much grief. But not a word was ever exchanged between them on the subject. There are two other phases in Kierkegaard's boyhood, and of his father's influence upon the development of his mind, which I shall allow him to describe in his own words, quoting the sketch given of Johannes Climacus, the principal character in de omnibus dubitantum est, of everything doubtful be, an unfinished metaphysical essay written by Kierkegaard in 1842-3, and undoubtedly autobiographical in character. His home life offered but few diversions. He was scarcely ever permitted to go out, and thus he became accustomed at an early age to attend to himself and to his own thoughts. His father was very strict and dry and prosaic, on the surface, but underneath this coarse and unpretentious exterior he preserved a glowing fancy, which not even his extreme old age was able to dull. When Johannes sometimes asked for permission to go out, he was most often refused. But occasionally, as if to make up for this refusal, the father proposed a walk together up and down the room. This seemed at first a poor substitute, and yet, like his father's coarse gray coat, it concealed under its plain exterior something very different from that which appeared on the surface. The proposal accepted, it was for Johannes himself to decide where to go. They passed out the gate and visited a neighboring palace, or went to the seashore, or wandered about the streets, all at the boy's pleasure. For the father's imagination was powerful enough to create a realizing sense of anything and everything the boy desired. While they walked up and down, the father described the sights along the way. They greeted the passers-by. The vehicles rumbled and drowned the father's voice. The dainties displayed by the fruit woman on the corner seemed more alluring than ever. When they were on ground familiar to Johannes, everything was given a description so vivid and minute that not the smallest detail was overlooked. When the way took them to scenes new and unfamiliar, the father knew how to draw so explicit a picture and give it so vivid an intuition that after but half an hour of this promenade, Johannes was as tired and overwhelmed by his impressions as if he had been out of doors an entire day. He soon learned how to practice his father's magic art for himself, a dramatic representation supplanted the former epic narrative, and they conversed together on the way. When they walked amidst scenes from which Johannes was familiar, they prompted one another faithfully, lest anything should be overlooked. When the way was strange, Johannes trusted his fancy to combine the elements of his memory into pictures, while his father's all-powerful imagination brought into being every least detail utilizing every childish wish as an ingredient in the drama. To Johannes it seemed as if he were witnessing, during the course of their conversation, a world coming into being. 
It was as if his father was the creator, and he himself a favorite, permitted freely to introduce his own childish fancies into the creative process. For he was never repressed, and his father was never at a loss. Every suggestion tender was made use of, and always to Johannes's complete satisfaction. With an all-powerful imagination, the father combined an invincible dialectic, and hence, when at times the father was engaged in argument with a neighbor, Johannes was all ears, and this so much the more, as everything in these discussions was arranged with ceremonious order and precision. His father never interrupted the opponent, but let him speak through to the end. When he appeared to have finished, he always cautiously asked him if there was anything more he wished to say before beginning his answer. Johannes had followed the argument with concentrated attention and was, in his own way, a truly interested participant. There came a pause, and then the father's reply. All was changed in the twinkling of an eye. How it was changed was a mystery to the boy, but his mind was fascinated by the spectacle. The opponent spoke in rebuttal, and Johannes was still more deeply attentive, if possible, than before. He wanted to bear every point in mind. The opponent approached his peroration, and Johannes could almost hear his own heartbeat. So impatient was he to hear the outcome of the argument. Then came the father's reply, and in a moment everything was changed. The things that had seemed clear before suddenly became inexplicable. The things which had seemed certain became doubtful and their very opposites were made to appear evident. What other children possessed in the enchantments of poetry and the surprises of adventure, Johannes had in the calm of a vivid intuition and the swiftly changing perspectives of dialectics. When he became older, he had no need to cast his playthings aside, for he had learned to play with that which was to be the serious business of his life, and yet it never lost its allurement. A girl plays with her dolls until at last the doll is transformed into a lover, for a woman's entire life is love. A similar continuity characterized Johannes's life, for his entire life was thought. In later years, Kierkegaard was accustomed to spend days and weeks in practicing on himself different emotional and temperamental states, an exercise which he describes as a kind of nimble dancing in the service of thought this making of himself an instrument for the exploration of the passions by which he attained an extraordinary command of the scale of human feeling was undoubtedly to a large extent made possible by the strange training of the imagination above described fantastic as it must seem to all straightforward souls a final and decisive paternal influence was that which had its source in the elder kierkegaard somber religiosity the sternness of the parental discipline, indeed, gave the boy a lofty impression of duty, for he was trained to a strict obedience, not that he was enmeshed in the web of a multiplicity of petty obligations, but with respect to the few commands that were laid upon him, it was the parental principle that no evasion was to be tolerated. Kierkegaard's large aesthetic sensibility thus received a restraining and balancing counterpoise, in the form of a strong sense of the value of obedience, of authority, and even of an uncompromising severity. This left a permanent mark upon his thought. But it was in connection with the teaching of the Christian dogma that the father's influence was most pregnant with significance. The boy heard little at home about the gentle Christmas child, but so much the more of the suffering and crucified Savior. These impressions were brought so vividly to bear upon the boy's inner life as to do violence to his personality as a child, and in conjunction with his native melancholy they helped to rob his childhood of its natural heritage of spontaneity and immediacy. I have never, he said, enjoyed the happiness of being a child. This well-meant violence on the part of his father he later came to regard as a training unnatural to childhood and youth, but which nevertheless later, when he was mature enough to profit by it, became his most precious spiritual inheritance. But his childhood, he evolved, was burdensome with impressions, too heavy to bear, even for the old man who laid them upon me. My father's heir, however, was not to be lacking in love, but to forget the difference between a child and an old man. This misunderstanding, indeed, served to strengthen the bonds of filial piety. 
to love one who makes me happy is viewed in reflection an imperfect form of love to love one who from motives of malevolence makes me unhappy is virtue but to love one who makes me unhappy because he loves me and hence by a misunderstanding but nevertheless really makes me unhappy that is a form of love which to my knowledge has never yet been described a form of love nevertheless which when viewed in reflection is revealed as the normal form of love the religious discourses of kierkegaard's authorship were repeatedly dedicated in their successive issues to my deceased father michael patterson kierkegaard formerly a merchant of this city three when kierkegaard was twenty-five his father died at this time so he describes himself his personality was a strangely developed potentiality fortunate in the external circumstances of his life initiated into all kinds of pleasures equipped with a superfluity of culture gifted with imagination and the power of dialectic he was an observer and student of human nature his spirit was high strung and proud that he should ever be defeated in any undertaking seemed to him inconceivable except that he had no hope ever to be able to overcome his melancholy in his heart he entertained a lively sympathy for all who suffered oppression and hardship and his total attitude toward life was thoroughly polemic he had long entertained the ambition to be able to help others to clearness of thought especially in connection with the christian religion for which he had never lost his respect although troubled indeed by doubts in many instances doubts of which he had never even read or heard the death of his father however had caused a revival of the religious impressions of childhood which he now came to experience in a somewhat idealized and less harsh form a passage from the journals written at the age of twenty-two reveals the nature of his intellectual orientation the entire passage is a sort of stock-taking a review of his varied interests and ambitions my misfortune he says is that i am interested in too many things and not decisively committed to any one thing to which i might subordinate everything else along with jurisprudence the theatre theology he takes up the claims of natural science as a possible prospective vocation distinguishing between the industrious collector of facts and the organizing intellectual genius who succeeds in gaining a view of the whole he expresses his admiration for the latter nevertheless he concludes that it does not seem possible for him to make natural science his chief concern the passage continues it has always been the life of reason and freedom which has most interested me and it has always been my wish that i might solve the mystery of life the forty years in the wilderness before i could enter into the promised land of science appear to me too precious so much the more since i have an idea that nature may also be viewed from another side without requiring an insight into the secrets of science in a particular flower i may train myself to see the whole world or i may listen to the many hints and suggestions which nature offers with respect to human life theology would seem to be the sphere to which my interest most clearly inclines me but my theological studies have hitherto met with the greatest difficulties within christianity itself such great contrasts present themselves as at least to place obstacles in the way of an impartial survey orthodoxy i have so to speak been brought up in but as soon as i began to think for myself the huge colossus began to tumble i call it purposely a colossus for it has in the main much inner consistency and in the course of centuries the individual parts of it have been so fused together that it is hard to come to close quarters with them simply as isolated features there are individual points on which i might be able to reach an agreement with the orthodox doctrine but these would then have to be regarded as the green sprouts which may sometimes be found growing in the cleft of the barren rock on the other hand i might possibly be able to discern the errors and perversities present at other points 
but the foundation itself I would have to hold, for a time, in dubio. If the foundation were to be changed, the whole would, of course, have to be viewed in a different light. And so my attention is drawn to rationalism. But rationalism seems to me to cut a very sorry figure, in so far, indeed, as the reason consistently follows its own impulses and spirit in the attempt to clear up the relation between God and the world. And in so far as it thus considers man in his deepest and most intimate relationship with God, and hence also comes to take Christianity into account from its own standpoint as the religion which for so many centuries has satisfied man's deepest religious need, in so far indeed no objection can be urged against it. But this is not what rationalism proceeds to do. It takes its essential coloring from Christianity and hence stands on an entirely different footing. It is not a system, but a Noah's Ark, wherein the clean and the unclean animals lie down side by side. It makes about the same impression on me as the civilian guard we formerly had here in Denmark, beside the royal Potsdam guard. It seeks essentially to base itself upon the scriptures, and sends a legion of scriptural passages before it at every point but the exposition and development is not itself saturated with this consciousness. The rationalistic theologians behave like canvases, who, in campaigning against Egypt, sent the sacred fowls and cats before him. But, like the Roman consul, they are quite ready to throw the sacred animals overboard when these refuse to eat. What I really need, however, is a clear mind regarding what I ought to do not so much as to what I ought to know, except in so far as some sort of knowledge precedes all doing. I need to understand my place in life, and to see what call the divine power has for me. I need to discover a truth which is a truth for me. I need to find the idea for which I can live and die. For what would it profit me if I discovered some so-called objective truth? if I worked my way through all the philosophical systems and could pass them in review when necessary, or if I were able to point out the inconsistencies within each particular school of thought, what would it profit me if I were able to develop a theory of the state, to combine scattered facts gathered from many sources into a totality, and thus construe a world in which I did not live, but only held up to the gaze of others? What would it profit me if I could expound the significance of Christianity and explain many of its particular phenomena if it had no deeper significance for me and for my life? What I need is the power to live a complete human life and not merely a life of knowledge, lest I come to base my thought upon something so-called objective, in any case something not my own. I need something that is connected with the deepest root of my existence something through which I am linked, so to speak, with the divine, and to which I could cling even if the whole world were to fall in ruins about me. It is in these closing aspirations that the keynote of Kierkegaard's subsequent life and thought is clearly struck. End of recording Father and Son Saren Kierkegaard by David F. Swenson Pages 1 through 8